Okay, so good evening after a little delay, but uh, happily we are together again. So the first question is, um, how does the Guru Yoga uh, of the White R relate to using PET? So the basic uh, orientation in Sokshen is that the purity of the mind is always present. But we, in the sense of our being a separate individual caught up in our thoughts and emotions and so on, uh, are not in touch with it. So there are many different methods of trying to bring about an opening so that these two seemingly separated domains uh, can show their original in integration. So when we do the Guru Yoga, <clears throat> excuse me, with the sound of ah, we are relaxing out of our fixation on subject and object as different. And if we use the sound of pet, it is a disruptive method to shock a gap between the seemingly uh, uninterrupted flow of thoughts and feelings. It just really depends on circumstances, outer circumstances, which is going to be easy to do. Nice. And uh, inner circumstances, what is our mood? The basis, the basic division in all the methods is whether there appears to be somebody doing it or not. If I am doing it, then it is as if I am making it happen. And this leads to the sense of a separation between the subject and the object. So generally speaking, the more active the method, the more it has a kind of shadow or disadvantage that it is subtly affirming my sense as the doer or the maker. So the reason why we uh, privilege or uh, focus on the Guru Yoga of the White R is that by releasing the sense of agency is also dissolved into spaciousness without effort. So the less effort you can make, the better. Because the method uh, and strong engagement sucks energy into the self position. That position is itself empty. But it, when it uh, vibrates with the energy of our identification, it is as if it seems to be something there. Okay, so the next question is how to work with a habit of technique-based mindfulness practice with a strong presence of the watcher? So this is uh, in some way similar to the previous question. I can be mindful of my posture, mindful of my breathing. That is to say, I am mindful of something. So with that kind of orientation, there is the advantage that you minimize distraction because before you start the practice, you know what you're going to focus on. So that could include body scanning in a Vipassana style, but there is still clearly a doer. Someone is doing the watching. Who is that? I am even if you try to maintain a, a very pure, simple watching, it, it, it's a space because it's still very close to the ego sensibility. It, in, it invites the association of thoughts and feelings. So uh, the, the Tibetan word that was used to translate sati, which is the, uh, Sanskrit, Pali, a term for mindfulness is dremba, which means to recollect or remember. So you bring your attention back to something. Now, if the focus of your attention is space, then when you try to bring your ego in relation to space, the ego, which needs something to hold on to, doesn't like it. 
And so we get distracted because the distraction is simply the ego finding something it can hold on to. Only the sky can be aware of the sky. The more we empty the content of the mind and the sense of mental functioning, the more space there is for the non-duality of uh, space so that it can appear subject or object. So from the Dzogchen point of view, it's always about not trying too hard. Because again and again, we have to come back to the view from the very beginning, the mind has been complete. What we are looking for is already present. Complete means nothing needs to be added, nothing needs to be subtracted. Therefore, we relax and open and relax and open. And this is the form of mindfulness in Dzogchen. But if you start from the belief that I am often confused, I'm easily distracted, my mind is all over the place, then it seems obvious, oh, I have a problem. I need to bring myself together to focus my energy and, and really stay on task. So this is the big difference. If you start with the problem and you try to solve the problem, this is good Dharma practice, but it's not Dzogchen. In Dzogchen, we start with the absence of problem. And when a problem arrives, we are not the sort of people who have problems. So we say, no, thank you. If you don't smoke and somebody offers you a cigarette, you say, no, thank you. When thoughts, feelings, sensations arise on a buffet table, we just say, oh, no, thank you because we want to open to our awareness, which has no need. When we see that this is the ground of our presence, then when we get up from our sitting, we move into the world where we have to make uh, decisions going this way or that. And this requires us to uh, decide on a particular uh, value. If you live in a village or a town, there are different shops. So if you are going to the post office, maybe you go down one road. And if you are going to buy fruit, you go down another road. What is arising in your mind formulates your energy of manifestation. So you walk in one way or another. Each choice we make has a situational value, but no intrinsic value. You go to the post office to buy stamps. If you don't need stamps, you don't go there. The arising of the sense, I need a stamp, takes me to the post office. Having bought my stamps, I don't need to continue thinking about the post office. Here we see the self arising and self vanishing of a thought pattern. So it's not about blocking thoughts and feelings but allowing them to arise and vanish as they become the texture of the unfolding world that we are moving in. So if you have a, a habit of um, striving in meditation with a clear sense of a goal, you can see that you are uh, trying to uh, organize and direct uh, what is arising. So you are like a shepherd organizing the sheep. But in Dzogchen, we are concerned with freedom. But sheep are not free. We are, we are concerned with the birds in the air. The sheepdog is not able to organize which way the crows are flying. So when we sit in a meditation, we say, whatever comes, comes. We're not trying to make anything happen. We're not believing that one pattern of manifesting is better than another because there is no inherent existence or inherent value in any of the patterns which arise. The value is situational. So if I want to buy oranges, going into the post office is useless. It shows the relativity of value. So as we manifest in the world, 
new situations are revealing themselves moment by moment. And if we are free in ourselves without a, a fixed agenda, we can respond. Okay, then the next question, the many veils of samsara are so thick, can we truly find a way out of samsara? This is a beautifully formulated impossible question. Because again, we are starting with a problem. The veils in samsara are very thick. Or if we make it more personal, I get lost very easily. Since I get lost, how can I find my way? Wait, from the point of view of Sokshen, the question is, where are you lost? Why do you think you are lost? Because I'm not where I should be. I, I'm not among the Buddhas. When I go outside, I see so according to the all pretty limited. According to the limitation of my mind, they are very limited. So either I get away from being where all these limited people are, or I try to find out what it means to be limited. What limits me are my habits, my impulses, my concepts, my feelings. So from the Dzogchen point of view, the instruction is simply stay present with your habits, your impulses, and so on. The thought comes, I need to get up. I'm very restless. I need to get up is a an interpretation arising from the fact that there is a feeling of restlessness. If I sit here feeling restless, I won't be happy. So maybe I could be unhappy. But I, I'm looking for freedom from liberation. How can that be the same as just sitting and being unhappy? So there we see, oh, you are formulating the idea as freedom from limitation. And because we have many, many limitations, we will be running, we will be running forever. In Dzogchen, we are concerned with freedom with, freedom with my depression, my anxiety, my self-hatred. So I'm sitting in some horrible thought about myself arises, the one who picks up that thought, who merges with it, is the self. That's something we know how to do. But the encouragement is simply relax or relax into the out breath and allow whatever comes to come and go. I hate myself. This only seems to be about me if I pick it up. The thought is arising and it's vanishing. All mental events are impermanent. They vanish very quickly. So the limitation is not in the object which arises, but in my identification with it. So I identify with the content because of a vibration or anxiety. This is why the central point in Sokshen is to relax. My mind is complete, nothing to add and nothing to take away. But my ego constellation, which is a movement inside the flow of experience, this ego self is always concerned with adopting some things, taking them in and pushing other things away. I don't want to be like this. I want to be like that. So push away and pull in. But when we observe ourselves, we see how much effort we have made in our life to modify ourselves, to develop certain qualities. And yet we've never arrived at some place stable. So the key point is to see what I take to be myself is not a fixed entity. It is a series of patterns of energy. 
It's like the waves that are always moving on the ocean. How will I find any peace if I'm moving this way and that with each new wave that arises? So as Garab Dorji points out, the central first point is to open to your mind as it is in itself. Because if we do not see that the mind itself is not a thing, then our identification always falls onto this shifting pattern of ego identity. So that the, 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 uh, the emergent idea, I am tired or I am hungry, becomes a definition of some truth of me, even although it is very situational and dependent. Right. And so when it seems to be real and true, I have to do something. If I'm hungry, I must eat something. But if I was reading a book and really interested in it, I might not feel the hunger, which might be in the, the nerves in my stomach. That is to say, the value of the sensation, which I interpret as hunger, is not fixed. It is also situational. So in this way, we have to see that these uh, thick veils are, in fact, not some object which is hiding our life from us, but is our own deluded search for true value in the impermanent. The, the veils in samsara are thick because we make them thick. We don't do this because we are bad people, but because we are looking for something permanent where there is only impermanent. This is our delusion. We are, we are like somebody who thinks there really is water in a mirage. And I look and look and, oh, maybe there is no water in this mirage, but in the next one, for sure, there will be water. So instead of learning from experience, oh, this is a mirage, it has no water. I, I am sure that my concept, my belief that there is water in a mirage is the truth. And this is the mental dullness that stops the ego from relaxing and thinking, hey, this is, a, this is a losing game. Why am I playing this? Then uh, there's a question. Over the years, you have decided to translate some words or ideas differently. For example, uh, Yidam, I put as wishing God or as path deity. Then the question is, what is the thinking behind this? Hopefully it's that I have learned something over the many years I have been looking at these things. This is a time of transition for Dharma coming into the West. And this presents certain problems. If we fix the vocabulary for how to translate the many, many Tibetan technical terms, then this makes translation very uh, quick. And when you're reading the translation, you really can believe you know what's, what's being concerned. But many of these technical terms have multiple meanings. And the different meanings arise in different contexts. In this uh, variety of possibilities means that you, Certainly in some kind of text, you can read, <clears throat> excuse me, you can read the meaning of a, of a sentence in several ways. So it is a work in progress. So in English, we have at least 50 translations of the poems of uh, Baudelaire. Why is one not enough? Because translation always brings problematics. So, for the reader as well, we have to read with a delicacy, with a lightness and sensitivity, and participate with our whole being, and try to feel <clears throat> the resonance of the words. And they will evoke different memories in yourself, different 
sense of possibilities, reading is a conversation. You may have some novels that you've read many times in your life. Each time you read it, new aspects become foreground and very significant. And what seemed very significant before maybe recedes into the background. So if this example uh, speaks to you, then you ha might have a sense that learning Dharma, practicing Dharma is to enter into a conversation. Buddha Shakyamuni spoke to the people around him. We believe that his student Ananda was able to very accurately remember everything the Buddha said. Later it was written down. But as soon as it was written down, you started to have commentaries because there is always some density in the text which can be teased out and unpacked. So when we study a Dharma text, we shouldn't be trying to grasp onto it to, to get some definitive meaning. If the Dharma is going to speak to us, it will speak to us as in our embodied being with our own gender, age, history, and so on. So it's an ongoing uh, movement. The, the French uh, scholar, Blanchot, he described it as the infinite conversation. And we read some more books, so we hear another teaching and it brings a new flavor. And, and so each of these, rather than presenting you with something to hold on to, is more like a massage that can be loosening some of the tensions and fixations that we are trapped in. So it's for that reason that uh, I have revisit uh, translations I've done before and I often present a new formation of it. Whatever capacity I have to illuminate something depends on the degree of clarity that shines through me in the moment. In the, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, people who are practicing Dharma as their main occupation would travel around and see many, many different teachers and hear the same text explained in maybe 20 different ways. If you were trying to draw a tree, each time you looked at the tree, you would see some new aspect. And if you sat all day to draw the tree as the sun moved across the sky and the shadows changed, the tree that you saw would be shifting and turning. The tree is offering possibilities of participation. The tree is not a thing. If you look at it in the moonlight, this is something very different. It's the same with everything in our life. Our toothbrush looks different according to our mood, but you will only see that your toothbrush looks different. If you look, you can use your toothbrush for a week without seeing it. You're on automatic pilot asleep in your assumptions. And what this does is it allows the concept of my toothbrush to seal this uh, thing in your hand into a shape which requires no examination. I know what it is. Now, if we are Dharma people, we should be shocked. Toothbrush is what we call this, but how is it? And we have to see and the, the amount of light coming in the window, whether we are in a hurry or not, whether the, we've changed the make of toothpaste. Some have little strips of red or they have different kinds of color in them. That will affect the toothbrush. Assumptions are stable, but phenomena are unstable. In Dzogchen, we turn to the phenomena, to the simplicity of light, in sound, the immediacy of non-conceptual appreciation of the beauty. So the texts are gestures of uh, appreciation. And if you bring your own capacity for 
appreciation into it, then different aspects will unfold in different moments. So the next question is, <clears throat> if I follow Dharma, how to enjoy life without feeling guilty that I am not studying or saying mantras? Dharma practices, including study and saying mantras and visualization, are like a donkey. You sit on the donkey. That's what the donkey is for, to carry you. We talk about vehicles and paths. If you, perhaps you want to be a world champion weightlifter, in which case carrying your donkey is very useful. But Dharma is for you. Dharma is to help you open to life. Dharma as teaching and practices is artificial. We engage with the artificial to alter our energy so that we can open to the non-artificial. So the texts say that uh, wisdom is emptiness and method is compassion. All the different Dharma techniques and possibilities of study are the compassion of the Buddha, designed to help us awaken to wisdom. Dharma is important as method. So you have to learn to use the method. If you say it is holy Dharma, therefore I have to do it because it's holy, you may as well be Roman Catholic. They also believe what they do is holy and they do what they do because they know it's holy. This is a solipsistic uh, circle. And the Buddha taught the Dharma not to make Buddhists, but to make Buddhas. So if you feel guilty and bad because you're not doing enough Dharma, then it's, it's as if you imagine that you are building up a supply of Dharma knowledge as, as if it was money and a currency. Now, this is a way of thinking and talking, which you find in Dharma. Talk about accumulating merit and wisdom, that they are tools for helping us to progress. But this is not the view of Dzogchen. The two accumulations are necessary if you are in samsara and you need to buy a ticket to Nirvana. But when we study in Dzogchen, we we read from Samantabhadra, the original Buddha, that uh, the ground is free of both samsara and nirvana. It is not a thing. Ignorance is not seeing that the ground is open and empty. And in not seeing that, it is the process of beginning to imagine there is something there and I am someone here. And on the basis of this interpretation, we formulate all the different uh, seeming separate entities of the world. But when we look at our text, it says, there is no limitation and no liberation. But we feel we are trapped in samsara. <clears throat> Who is trapping us? We are trapping ourselves by holding on to things which we can't catch. Because we can't actually catch phenomena, we catch concepts. And with concepts, we weave them together into narratives, into storylines. And because we are wrapped in the story, we're not able to see that the story is illusion. Illusion doesn't mean that the story is worthless or shouldn't be there. Illusion means don't take the story too seriously. If we function in the world, method is to be able to operate in the domain of narrative. And wisdom is to know that stories establish nothing at all. So if you are doing Dharma activities like visualizing and doing mantras and counting them and so on, you have to do it with faith, but not seriousness. 
if you consolidate your practice, it becomes just something I have to do. So if you do practice and then you don't do it, then you can see for yourself whether doing some practice helps you or not. Then for yourself, you know whether it has value. But if you just do it because it's very important and your teacher told you to do it, then you're in a narrative, in a story. So don't turn Dharma into a burden. The middle way is not too serious, but also of value. And if you're not doing formal, official Dharma practice, if you observe the blossom in the trees, see, see beauty. Beauty is uncatchable, and yet it touches you. Touch, touched by nothing. This is pure Dharma. When the wind blows across your face, sensation and nothing. Dharma is everywhere in everything. Then there is a, a, quite a general question. What are the possible energetic experiences when Dzogchen practice is going the right way? This again is a kind of impossible question because it Im implies that each of us in our energetic composition is kind of standard issue from a factory. So, According to our activities in previous uh, lives, in previous situations, we find ourselves with this body. Some people are very sensitively connected to their body, others are not. Some people have bodies free of pain. Others have a lot of pain running through the body, through nerve problems and so on. So there is no standard issue body. And so we have to attend to the specificity of what arises for us as what we call our body. People have different capacity with their sense of smell, with the kind of taste they can have in their mouth, with the kind and intensity of orgasms they can experience. The body has its own patterning. So first of all, you have to make friends with your own body and see how it is. And then you yourself can see what changes are occurring in it, according to practice. But there is no standard issue. I mean, generally, people talk of this uh, nyam or meditation experience. Uh, in particular, in connection with the body, it would be dewa, uh, pleasure or bliss how that manifests is also influenced by how the prana is moving in your subtle channels. But for meditators, the key point is do not enter into comparing and contrasting. Somebody tells you that they had a wonderfully clear vision of Padmasambhava. What does this mean? It means that they had a wonderfully clear image of Padmasambhava. What does that mean? That's open, you can interpret it. Could be all sorts of things. Padmasambhava could be coming because almost, almost to the last drop, your good karma is now finished. I've come to see you because you won't see me again for a long, long time. We're in the realm of stories. But why did they get that vision and I don't get a vision? They must be doing better than me. You can see if you compare and contrast and you uh, reify, you make substantial these kind of momentary experiences, then you give yourself a headache. Comparing ourselves to other people is not helpful because you can only compare a thing with another thing. And our practice is designed to dissolve the delusion that we are a thing. So for practice, we shouldn't be concerned with success or outcome, because then you're coming to a conclusion. 
very often the mind is clear for a few days, then it's not clear. This is like the sky in England. For some days there are a lot of clouds, then there's no clouds. The sky is always clear itself, but the clouds come and go. So if you are observing the clouds, you learn about clouds. Because you can say the clouds are big or small or dark or light or moving quickly or slowly, but the sky is just the sky. We are concerned with the sky. So measuring the quality of the clouds of your transient experience is not really good practice. But of course, in the question, there's a slight anxiety, like how can I know that I'm going in the right way? Well, in the, in the description from Samantabhadra, it describes how when we are not attending to, or when we are ignoring the open ground, our experience starts to thicken. So that's quite a simple idea. We know what it's like when we have an intense emotion. It's as if we are wrapped in anger or jealousy or desire. There's a kind of thick feeling inside our body as well. And when we are relaxed and at ease and we respond to the wide variety of uh, stimuli around us, we are more thin. So the thickening arises because of the intensity of dualistic uh, contact and grasping and merger. So clearly thin is more useful than thick. If the haze is thin, then you can see through it. If it's thick, you can't. You see that in nature. Sometimes mist comes in a valley and at first it's very fine. You see through it, then it thickens and you don't know where you are. So generally speaking, life should get lighter and easier and everything should be <clears throat> transparent and thin. If a difficulty arises, you feel sad, and then it's gone. If you find your mind thinking about that bad experience, and you, you are at all attentive to your experience, you, you, can, you can see directly how you feel thick and dense, and you're losing contact with the environment. Leave me alone. I'm in a bad mood. Just leave me alone. It means I'm just in this. I can't get out of it, but don't fucking try. Leave me. It would be surprising if we didn't know what that kind of experience is like. So there's attachment. There's fusion into the thickness and intensity of a dualistic moment. But only you yourself, individually, can know your profile and have a sense of how it moves and changes with circumstances. Our goal is not to improve the content of our mind, but rather to be open and present with however our mind is. You can be sad when you're sad, angry when you're angry, hungry when you're hungry but not making these uh, positions or flavors a way of life or a fixed identity. So then the next question is, in Sokshen, what is the meaning of the unchanging nature of our mind? The unchanging nature of the mind is that it is beyond thought. And that's a little sneaky kind of answer because the thoughts are always moving. So the unchanging nature of the mind has to be free of thought. Thought changes, moves, interacts, develops, declines, and so on. So the unchanging nature of the mind is 
the, the base or the ground, which is open and empty and ungraspable. And this is inseparable from awareness, which is the illuminating capacity of the ground to reveal the spaciousness within which the clarity of experience arises. And this is inseparable from the phantom-like movement, the apparitional movement of how we are moment by moment moving in the, in the sea of, of experience. Each of us has never been born. Clearly, this sounds stupid. We have been born, we may have in our bag someplace our birth certificate. We were born into the world and into society, so our birth is registered. We are officially existing people. But this is like our persona, like a mask. It's like a calling card. This is the, the shape, the presentational shape of ourselves. But when you stay gently present with all of you, you see how your body pulses and moves with the environment. The body is part of the world. The ingredients of our body are what is found in the world, the different chemicals and so on. The world is showing itself as us. And from the Zoxian point of view, this world is the field of experience. It's the field of disclosure, of display of the clarity. This field of emergence is inseparable from the, from the open empty ground. Emptiness shows as light and within light there is movement. So in the Zokshen teaching it says the light arises as rays, but also as <coughs> blocks of light. So if I look out the window, I see the color of the different cars and the trees and gardens and so on. That is an aspect of light, which is actually inseparable from the rays of light that are coming from the sun. So this body is an emergence moment by moment. In the text, particularly in tantric texts, they describe our world as unborn and unceasing. So it, from that point of view, I am unborn. That is to say, I have never been a thing. When my parents had sex and the impregnation occurred, immediately complex processes were occurring. This continued for nine months in my mother's body. Then I came out and new processes started. Breathing air, umbilical cord cut, and starting to learn many, many different things. Oh, James is a term which is applied to an undefinable, ungraspable process, which is nonetheless showing itself. So in that sense, James is unceasing and yet unborn. And the more you look at this process of the many millions of James moments, the truth of this is emptiness. Because the light of the movement of my body that you might see at this moment is already vanishing. And because it hasn't become something, in a sense, it never changes. This becomes that. But if there is no this, what will that be? It is our dualistic conceptualization which gives birth to the entities of the world. So now we come to the end for today. We thank you for your attention. I hope it's useful. And thank you to all our translators, Maria, Jayachita, and Milton, and to Pedro for keeping a calm direction to our work. So for those who are interested, and we have the last part of the, well, maybe the last part of the Chet Samba this weekend.
Oh, I say goodbye for this evening. Have a good time. Bye. 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 Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. Adios, adios. Thank you. Adios. Adios. Thank you, James. Gracias, Milton. Gracias, Juan. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Obrigada, Milton. Eu que agradeço pela paciência. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.